Tonight we will be looking at the life of David. We've probably heard uh, King David. We heard many sermons. We probably read about his life. There is, it's, very, it's a very interesting life. There are many things that we can, can read about it. Paul, when he was doing his missionary journeys, he um, came to this town called Antioch. It wasn't the Antioch where the first Christ, uh, people were called Christians. It was this Antioch, which is west of Ephesus, in the middle of Turkey, what is today Turkey. And he came there, and he, what he standardly did on the Sabbath, he would go to the synagogue, and he would meet with uh, the Jews that would meet together there. And they asked him to, to, uh, to preach there, so he did. And out of his sermon in Acts 13.22, um, he, he mentions there that God said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. That's quite a statement when God says that about someone, someone after my own heart. I think um, you and I would be wise to observe that person's life and learn from their experiences. A, God, a person that wa walks so close to God that God says, he's after my own heart. So we look at David. David began as a shepherd, and yet he ended up a king. The chances of that happening were actually zero. A, a shepherd in the Old Testament days was at the bottom of the totem pole. They were so rejected by society that they could not even testify in a court of law because um, their word was not considered reliable. Imagine being a shepherd and your whole life you're treated like trash. David began as a shepherd for his father's flocks. Yet later, David, in his life, ended up writing the most widely read psalms of all time. We need to understand this. When we invite God to come into our life and take over, he cancels the liabilities of our past, the things where you think it's impossible. There's, I'll never have a chance to get anywhere because of my position in life and that. He cancels the, the liabilities of our, of our past and he rewrites our future. God is amazing. And he has a plan for each of our lives, for your life and my life. And we may think, I, I, I'm nothing. I, I really can't do much. I don't have very many talents and this and that. But God does have a plan for you and for me. However, we must choose what God chooses for us. We often map out our own lives. We have a plan for our lives. And we often then forget about God. And when things go bad and things go south and nothing works out, then sometimes people start thinking, wow, I never even consulted God about my future, what I should do about the plans in my life. There's an interesting contrast between Paul, the Apostle Paul, and David. King David. Paul lived his chapters of disobedience before he met Jesus. We know that Paul was a, a very learned man. He learned at, we would say, in the best schools of, of his time. He, uh, Gamaliel was known as one of the top scholars, and he, he learned as a Pharisee at his, at his feet, and he became very knowledgeable in the law, and he was very um, avid and very um, devout and he persecuted the Christians. He thought this was a, a wrong thing, and he went after them. We know that he followed them all over, and he was even there when Stephen was, was stoned. But uh, then he met Jesus, and Jesus transformed his life. When he met him there on the road to Damascus, he just, he was struck, and, and his life was totally transformed. And that's what Jesus does in our lives. Even though he had persecuted him and had such a bad reputation, his life has totally transformed. And from that moment on, he lived for God. And what a blessing was he in, in his whole life after that. He went on to live a life of an example. David, King David, became king at 30 years. And during his 40 years in leadership as king, he experienced devastating failure in his life, including adultery and murder. 
but in spite of the, some setba setbacks he had, they were actually terrible setbacks. He always came back to the Lord and said, Lord, what have I done? And he asked God to forgive him. And God in his love and his, his plan for his life, he, he forgave him and he gave him a new chance and he, and he helped him get out of these things. He continued loving God and that's why God could be with him. And we can read about him later that he was a man after the heart of God. There, is, there are two important lessons from the contrast of these both men. Number one, I would say, don't rush to judgment. It's not over until God says it's over. David's story is a warning to those who transgress, a rebuke to the self-righteous, and a verification of God's justice that won't allow you to escape your consequences. So David had some bad things that happened in his life, he wasn't close enough to God. He didn't consult God in that. And he had the consequences. And even though God forgives us, we still have to live with the consequences that our life has produced. Sometimes they're consequences that follow us the rest of our lives. Sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they're, they're long-term. Sometimes of short-term. But it's, it's very easy to judge someone. And I think we are all, probably all guilty of that. We look at someone, we see maybe what he has done, you say, wow, I would never do that. And we judge people. When I lost my spouse, people would come and say, oh, I feel sorry for you, I understand what you're going through. No, I've told people, you don't understand unless you lose your spouse. Nobody understands what it really means. It is something you, you personally have to experience, and everybody has a different journey he goes through. But we need to learn that we shouldn't rush to judgment and see that everybody has a journey he's going through in his life, and, and we don't really know what has all transpired to bring the person to this point. We look at, at just this one incident, and we say, how could you do that? How could you be such a person? But we don't know what all transpired to bring the person to this point. And I've learned, I'm trying to learn better to, to not judge right away. We need, God wants to restore us and he wants to make things right again in our lives. He wants to help us do that. So, The second point is God can bring good out of what seems like a bad situation. He can take every experience that we've been through and make it work for good. Either our, our own good or for the good of others. Paul and David, King David, could both testify to that. The bottom line is what Paul writes in, Ro in the Romans, Romans 8, verse 28. He says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Huh. That, that passage is easy to read, but when you sometimes are in a situation in life when things are really in the dumps and you think, wow, I, how, worse, how much worse can it get? But then... The Lord says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And then after some time, you look back in your life and you say, I had no idea that this would work out so good. And, you know, it makes you much more compassionate and understanding for people that are going through similar things. And it, it teaches us, it, we learn from that to become better and, and, and more mature in our lives. And we can be a help to others. We can learn lessons this morning, I mean this evening, from, from King David, imitating this man of faith. Hebrews 6 verse 12 tells us, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. There are those who have gone before us, those who are maybe an example for us today in their Christian walk, and we look up to them and say, wow, those are faithful people, I'd like to live like that. We had a family in, in Edmonton that observed our lives, and we had no idea and sometime later, the woman came to my wife and she says, you know, we're looking at a family that we could take as an example in our lives. And she said, we, we looked at your family and we said, we would like to be like the Pudels. And I, I had no idea. I said, God, you know, what if I would have failed? What if I would have been a bad example to people? They, these people could have been led wrong paths. So our lives, we... We are, in a, we are an open book and people watch us and may God help us that we would be such a blessing to others in our daily lives that, 
that when people are nervous, they say, wow, that is an example to follow. David is listed among the heroes of faith, even though he had failures in his life and, and, and things were fixed because he, he stayed with the Lord and he said, Lord, I failed here. And he, he repented of that and God forgave him and he gave him, gave him a new start again in his life again and again. So he's then listed in these, amongst all these heroes of faith. And he teach, will teach us important lessons tonight. The first lesson I would say is here, God makes the choice. When Samuel the prophet came to David's home to pick Israel's king, we know that story. One brother after another was presented, the oldest, and then the next in, in line. And, and Samuel looked at, at these people and he thought, wow, this would, he's a nice tall man, he looks good. That's probably the, the person God picked. No, God says he's not the one. One after another, and he went through all the brothers. And Samuel was kind of miffed. He says, is there no other one? Well, there's that little one, that, that youngest. He's out in the fields with the, shep with the sheep. Well, bring him in. And that was the one that God had chosen. Even though he was not even considered to be part of the family, I guess. He was the youngest and he wasn't even at home. God chose him anyway. Just like he chose a Deborah to lead the nation in a male-dominated society. They were to go to war against the enemy, and they were all too chicken, it seemed to be, the generals. And they said, well, they told Deborah, well, if you're the judge, and if you go ahead with us, you lead us, we'll then go. What were with all the men that were the generals? Why didn't they go ahead? But God found the woman who was willing to go, and he used her. So God has some wonderful ways he uses people. So we should try, stop trying to figure God out. We sometimes think we have God all figured out. This is how God works, but God works in, in total different ways than we often expect. And he uses sometimes people that we would say, who is that? I've never heard of that person. Also stop comparing yourself to others. That can be a real trap. We look at others and say, am I this person, that, and that? God wants to use you. If he calls you to something, he will use you with your talents and your gifts you have. And he will equip you and empower you to do his will. We would have rejected many of the people of God that God used throughout the generations. We have our ideas and plans and we think, huh, that person would never amount to anything. But then God used it that, that week, that unknown little David that was far away from home and with the sheep out there, he chose him to be the, become the next king of Israel. That shows us how little we actually really know. We need to trust God and say, I'll leave it up to you. You know what you're doing. And sometimes we should just let God work with whatever he's using, the different people, and say, pray for them and just say, God, make them a blessing. Use them the way you want to. Secondly, God designs the plan. Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who has begun the good work in you will complete it. So God designs the plan. Who designs the plan? Who performs it? Who should our confidence be in? It should be in God. His plan for David involved years of ducking Saul's spears, remember he was playing for him to try to soothe him when he, when he had his moments. And, and he, he just throw spears at him. I mean, could you sit there and play your harp and, 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 and have somebody throw spears at you? David took it. Uh, and then he, he had to flee from, from Saul because he tried to kill him. So then he lived in caves as a fugitive. And then a ragtag army of 600 men from all over gathered around David and they, they hung out with him and these misfits would actually redefine the word dysfunctional. They were dysfunctional people from all walks of life and they, who knows what kind of problems they had, but they came out to David. God trains us through the difficulties that we experience so we can uh, uh, handle the assignment he had in mind for us. We look at the life of Joseph, for example. He was 
very mistreated. What did he all go through? But God was preparing him for something in the future. And, and Joseph was just faithful to God. He was with him. We read again and again that God was with him. And in the end, overnight, he became the second most powerful man in the kingdom of Egypt. God was preparing him for that work. We would say, why would God lead us all these, these dark valleys, through these dark valleys and do all this? And sometimes we go through things and we question, we say, why do I have to go through this? But God makes no mistakes. When my wife was in the hospital and we saw that her situation, she was, in, she was basically paralyzed. She had GBS. She couldn't move anything. She was just laying there. And she could feel the touch if you touched her, but she was kind of out of the people that have GBS for the first few months, they say they don't even have a memory of what happened. We could only have two people visit, my son, and I chose with my eldest son and, and myself. We were the only ones that could go in the hospital to visit. And so I, he visited her in the morning. I came the afternoon that one day, and um, I says, was Mike here? She's, she's not, her head, no. And he was kind of ripped up. He said, I, I was there for a few hours, and she doesn't even remember that. But that's, that's how these, these things go. But I said, Lord, you know, if, if you want to take her to be home, I don't want her to suffer like this. And I told her that too. I said, honey, if you want to go home to be with Jesus, it's okay. Because when a person is dying or in the, on the verge of dying, it's sometimes good to tell him that. I know when my dad was dying, he somehow held on. We thought he would die. We were stand, standing around his bed, all the siblings. And, and he would be, he, we, we, he was... We have taken his heavy breaths and everything. He thought that was his last moment. All of a sudden, he woke up and he said, what are we all doing here? And we had to actually laugh. And, 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 and so he somehow hung on, and then he was kind of in a coma. And that one day, my sister, who he was, um, she was caretaking him towards the end. She crawled into bed beside Dad, and she, she spoke to him in the ear, and she said, Dad, it's okay. You can go. I release you. And I, I think it was the next day he died. So... It is, it is good, we go through difficulties, but we know that God doesn't make any mistakes. And God can help. So God also sets the schedule. Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Hebrews 6, verse 12. Imitate those through faith. We are to imitate those who are walking in faith and are an example to us. King David and others in scripture are such an example to us. And we, we do good to, to listen, to watch their lives, look at their lives, and, and learn from them. Patience means standing firm under pressure. I think per, patience has gone out the window in our society. Everything's instant. You, you want to find information, you take out your phone, you Google it, boom. When my wife was diagnosed with GBS in the emergency room, they told me uh, we had no idea what, what she had. She woke up in the morning, wanted to get, get up and go to the bathroom, and she couldn't stand. She just fell down. So my little granddaughter was over, and she, she comes down. She says, Opa, come up. Oma's calling you. So I went up there, and she couldn't even get up anymore. So, yeah, things just happen just suddenly like that. So we, we need to have patience. So anyway, we got in the hospital, and then they tell me the next morning, she, we think she has GBS. Says, What's that? I never even heard of that. So you go on Google, boom, you have the information right there. And then I found out what she had. But later on, they found out she had bone cancer on top of it, and that was really terrible. But anyway. So the, the prize belongs to the one who's committed for the long haul. That means we need to have patience. And even though we, we sometimes have to pray, Lord, give me more patience. We drive in traffic and it's not going and we're kind of angry in the car and we're saying, man, why, did, why don't the people drive? It's sometimes good just to sit back because pretty soon at the next light you'll meet those same people that you're trying to speed a by and everything. And they just say, why wasn't I more patient? It didn't help to be angry or upset because I meet them at the next light again. So David was anointed king in his teens. When they, that Samuel came to his house, he was still the shepherd boy, he was anointed to become king. But he had to wait for quite some time. He was 30 years old before he actually became king of Israel. He had to learn to be patient. And I'm sure there were moments when he thought, why does it take so long? 
what's going on when he was being chased or he was hiding out in a cave. I mean, we're humans. We have our feelings and we maybe think, why is this happening? God is doing a work of preparation in our lives, so we need to be ready when the time comes. Yes, waiting can be hard, but if we run before the starter fires the gun, we will be disqualified from the race. Sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and, and we don't consult God in, in our actions we do and then our, we have huge failure in life. We think, oh no, what did I do? Instead of asking God, what is your will for my life? So we need to have patience. We need to keep our eyes on the prize and just not give up. That's so important. That's another lesson we can learn here. Thirdly, David knew how to mobilize the forces. Sometimes we need to fight in our lives. Spiritually, we're constantly fighting against Satan and the devil with, his, with all his, his temptations and that. Paul writes in, to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Some of God's promises have to be fought for. He will not just throw them in our lap. And like I say, Satan is always there. He wants to do anything to destroy us and hold us up that we don't get to heaven. Hell has been created for for Satan and his angels, and he would like nothing more than to take as many as he can with him. And that's why he's out there every day tempting us and trying us and trying to bring us away from God. So we need, we need to expect resistance in serving God. That's just part of it. Even the great obstacles that come in our life, we need to overcome them sometimes. The Jebusites who controlled Jerusalem told David, you'll never get in here. See, Jerusalem, at that time, that city was built really high on this, this hill. It was a very smart move to build Jerusalem up there. And there was virtually no way to get up there because there was this, all these walls and this whole this big castle built up there. And humanly looking at it, you would say it's impossible. And they were quite proud of their, their achievement. It says, you know, you might as well give up. You'll never get, get in here. 2 Samuel 5 Verse 6b, the inhabitants of the land who spoke to David saying, you shall not come in here, but the blind and lame will repel you. They were so confident of, of, of their, their ability and, and, and their, their fortress that they had their, they thought David could not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. He, he, the name changed later, this, um, this city here and uh, he called it the city of David. Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, he shall be chief and captain. He found this one little loophole, this one little flaw in this whole city. So there was a shaft where the water went through up to the city, and he said, whoever goes through that shaft and gets into the city, you'll, you'll get a special position here. And so it was. We, we need to understand this. If, if he has to, God will bring you up through the gutter to get you to the throne. The word nevertheless, in German we have this word dennoch. It's so important. In spite of whatever it, everybody else says, and God will still do his thing. And nevertheless, that is a beautiful word. When we we're up to the neck in problems, in the muck where they had to go through the, that, that shaft to get up there to the city, they, they went through and they, they had victory. We may be up to our neck in, in problems and stuff like that. And the enemy says, you can't make it. And we maybe feel like giving up, you know, there's no sense. But God says, stand on my promises and say, nevertheless, rise up in faith and claim what God has promised. We need to stick through it and, and make it through. And when we, when we have the victory, we look back and say, thank you, God, for helping me. This is so wonderful. You gave your promises and you will fulfill those in my life. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all the forces to capture him, 2 Samuel 5, 17. So we will also have to fight to get our destiny and fight to hold it. With each new battle, we need to turn to God for fresh instructions. I was quite intrigued when Trump was still president and this COVID, whole COVID situation started, he appointed Vice President Pence, who was a devout Christian, to take over this whole COVID situation. 
And what did he do? He got a team together. And the first thing they did is they prayed that God would give them wisdom. And I thought, wow, if you base your thing on that, that is awesome. David asked the Lord when these Philistines were against him. He said, should I go out and fight the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? 2 Samuel 5, 19. The Lord replied, yes, go ahead. I will certainly hand them over to you. How wonderful that David would first ask the Lord. He didn't say, well, we'll go into battle and we'll see what happens. And when everything else fails, we'll ask God. That's how we act sometimes as humans. Even as Christians, sometimes we forget to ask God. But David here teaches us, ask first the Lord. And then when he got the green light, he could go with confidence that God would give victory. He had no doubt God would help them. They would have victory over the, their enemies, the Philistines here. So we can learn from this today, today that always have God with us on our side in decisions that we make. May God help us. Even in the small things of life, even in me coming here, I said, Lord, you've got to open the doors. If you want me to come here and, and preach the word of God, I trust in you that you can make a tr smooth transition to come in here. And, and, and it was a miracle that God did, and I'm so thankful that I can be here with you today. David also knew how to develop other leaders. He did not use people to get what he wanted. There are many people in our world today that, that use others. Oh, they're very good at that. And when things don't go right, then they blame you for, for what went wrong, that they're trying to use you. If, if things go good, oh, well, see, that was my idea. But David, he actually saw the talents at these people. He let them serve. He rewarded them and honored them. The result of this was they were willing to lay down their lives for him. David said, uh, Sam, 2 Samuel 23, he said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. But it was under the, the hands of the enemy. He had desire of this good water from this well of Bethlehem. And he had such... We continue reading, so three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines. They drew water from the well and brought it to David. You see, these people were so, um, so with David because he trusted them. And he gave them the confidence that they needed to do their job, these soldiers here. And they were willing to, to even go get a, a, a glass of water for him, going through enemy lines. If you can have a team of people that stand behind you, you trust them in leadership, that's such a wonderful thing to have people that you can trust and you, you show them and they just blossom in, in the duties that they have to do. And the kingdom of God can be greatly built by that. It's impossible to learn in, in leadership without actually leading because leadership is action. Much could be said here, but David had a great team that he trusted. The more barriers that are removed for the people, the more likely they are to rise up to their potential. If you try to micromanage everything, in, in, even within the church, and sometimes things people get discouraged and they say, well, it seems like I, I can never do it good enough. It comes down to trust. David developed leaders who became known as mighty men. We read about them. They were mighty men that served him. And we do good to also imitate such action. And the last point I come to tonight were the last words of David. David came close to the end of his life, and someday we will all die, and our oft, often our last words are considered some of our most important. The question is, have you lived to your highest potential and fulfilled God's purpose for your life? Second Samuel 23, verse 1, we read here, these are the last words of David. We wonder, what will he tell us? What will he talk about? He had a very colorful life. His life was actually a checkerboard of good and bad, of profit and loss, victory and defeat. When we look closely at David's life, during his lifetime, his son raped his own daughter. One son killed another. His wife turned his back on him. His friends betrayed him, and they took his kingdom from him. His mentor, King Saul, repeatedly tried to kill him. 
His family rejected him. And as we already said, he spent a lot of time in hiding in caves and in the wilderness. So now David speaks to us one last time. We probably wonder, will he talk about the battle he had with Goliath there? The great victory he had? Or would he talk about King Saul? How he is being chased by him throughout the wilderness and all those other things? Or his misstep with Bathsheba? No. David, the man who was raised up so high, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, we read here in 2 Samuel 23, it says here, the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, the one who rules righteously in the fear of God is like the light of the morning at sunrise, a morning without clouds, the gleaming of the sun on the new grass after rain. Is it not my family God has chosen? Yes, he has made an everlasting covenant with me. His agreement is arranged and guaranteed in every detail. He will ensure my safety and success. So he praises God here at the end of his life, and he, he only talks about what God has really done in his life. He gives him the glory, and he speaks only of him. All these other things that he went through, they were in the past. Some of this stuff wasn't that good, and there was not even good to remember that. His success was in God, in his God that he served. So why are these words included in scripture? I think it's there for the benefit of us. Those of us like David who are not perfect, who have maybe things in their lives that we look back and say, wow, how could I ever be so dumb? How could I do such things? But whose hearts never cease to please and follow God. That, that was David. And he's such an example for us. He's listed among the heroes of the faith in Hebrews and a man after God's own heart who will do my will. What a beautiful scripture passage this is and, and encourages us to, tonight here. So in closing, what, were, what will our last words be that we speak? What kind of legacy will we leave behind? I remember going to, we have a grave site where my wife is buried. And um, I went back shortly, right before I came. I wanted to see if the gravestone had been placed. I don't know, it takes a long time. And by us, basically, when the frost hits, they can't set gravestones anymore. And they have to wait till the next spring. So there's this gravestone close by. And there's, it seems to be a Corvette on this thing. And the guy, I don't know, he was 38 years old or something like that, and then there's some, some weird comment on there about him with his car and all that, and you think, what a thing to leave on a, on a grave site, you know? So people put the strangest things on, on gravestones for, for what their lives are about. To be like David, you and I need to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That is the most important thing that we need to do. David knew the God of Israel, the God of Jacob from the Old Testament, and he served them with the best ability he could. And we have even more in our day. We have Jesus Christ who came to die on our behalf. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came for you and me, and he wants to give us new life. He wants to give us hope. He wants to give us a purpose for living, that we just don't live aimlessly and have a life at the end where we say, what a wasted life. Without Jesus in our lives, you will be going toward an eternity of destruction, hopeless in hell forever. So today is yet time of grace, time to make ready for living a life that can be then said a person after God's own heart. Won't you make that most, more, most important decision in your life before it's too late? I mean, even tonight would be a wonderful opportunity if you don't know Jesus or maybe you've, you've walked away from a life with him. It would be a wonderful opportunity to say, come to Jesus, say, you know, 
forgive me and give me a new chance. Give me a new beginning so my life can amount to something, so I can have something that I leave a legacy behind. So I pray tonight that these lessons today from the life of David are a blessing and an encouragement to keep on going and never give up, to keep moving forward, knowing that God is with us. May God help us. Amen.